I remember when my daughter was three years old and we were talking about the flooding and she was like, Mama, if I wake up one morning and I just step out my house, but I eventually step into water, I'm like, years from now, possibly could. Louisiana has lost an area greater than the Grand Canyon. Given some of the sea level rise predictions, we could lose double that over the next 50 years. It's an economic disaster waiting to happen as well. We power this nation, we feed this nation, we provide all sorts of commerce for this nation. This is a national issue. They come into our community and they come up with these large-scale, very expensive projects, and we don't have a voting seat at the table. You just can't say, oh, we're just going to pay y'all and move y'all. Where you gonna go? This gentleman been fishing his whole life. What do you do? What they're doing ain't working. It's not gonna work. And it's costing everybody. When I, when I was a kid, I tell you what, five was like maybe 25 foot wide. Uh, and trees on both the bodies. Now you can see some of the stuff where the trees was. See? Some, of the, some of the oak trees that was there. Right here, that was a church right here. Right there in that area right there. There was a house there, and a house right here, and a house in the middle. You know, all the trees. That's the church is gone, two houses right here is gone. That's what's between the two. We are losing somewhere in the neighborhood of a football field every 100 minutes, uh, which is just a remarkable statistic to put your mind around. The problem is, is this part of our coast particularly isn't receiving new sediment. Most of the south central, southeastern Louisiana coast was formed because the Mississippi River kept moving back and forth across the coast, depositing sediment, nutrients, and organic material over thousands of years. The Great Flood of 1927 was the, the biggest flood on record at that time. Uh, not just Louisiana, but Mississippi and other states upriver uh, sustained major flooding, which called for a comprehensive levying of most of the lower Mississippi River. And it was decided that we should uh, put levees all along the Mississippi River, which of course was very smart from the perspective of defending homes and infrastructure and communities from flooding, but very challenging in the sense that it, it cut off our sediment source. When you cut off that sediment, it allows those layers to begin sinking and after the levee system was completed it got much worse after that. That sediment that once came out of the banks now stayed in the Mississippi River and ultimately went straight down to the Gulf of Mexico. Louisiana was growing about three quarters of a square mile a year every single year and when they put the levees on the river we saw an immediate reversal so overall we've lost around 2,000 square miles. There's bayous that have camps on both sides. And when I take you there, you would say, just a bunch of pilings out in the middle of the water. But if I go through those pilings, you can see, oh, wow, it does flow right through here. Those were people who lived in those camps. We lost our whole culture just like that, and nobody cares. That's the only camp that got left on, on this, this system. If people didn't rebuild because there's no land, and there's no trap, and there's no the fisheries depleted. You know, it's this an oyster fisherman camp here. That's why they still here. But all this used to be camps. Everywhere you see these pilings, and all that stuff out there is oil infrastructure that's left over from the day. Now we're faced with two other issues that have occurred, which is you have oil and gas development, and a lot of canals were dug to uh, serve that industry. Those canals have cut off the flow of water. They create avenues for salt water to come into the delta and kill the vegetation. Additionally, the BP oil spill in 2010 killed a lot of plant life, and um, anytime you kill vegetation, that kills the roots of what holds the land together. Now we've got sea level rise on top of that, and that's been increasing rather significantly. If we take a, a portion of our, of our coast right now, say it is subsiding at 10 millimeters per year, the water levels, the sea levels in the Gulf are rising, let's say, 3 millimeters a year. So that's 13 millimeters per year 
of relative sea level rise. What we're not getting is any material to fill that void. So in the last 80 or 90 years, the state's lost about 2,000 square miles. And, you know, into the future, if, you know, if projections hold and, and we see an increase in the eustatic sea level rise, that problem's only going to get worse. The U.S. Geological Survey um, took some uh, infrared satellite photographs of this area. When you look at that, that infrared photograph, it looks like it's a lot of land, right? But then the state said, take off everything that's wet, just leave on the dry stuff. And then what you get is two little fingers of land, and that's why those wetlands are so important. And when they're gone, we'll just be two little speed bumps sticking out into the Gulf of Mexico, hardly any resistance to storm surge. When I started fishing here, they still had cypress trees standing here. Really makes me ill to come on this side of the river. Sometimes I don't even know where I'm at anymore. <laughs> That's the Gulf of Mexico right there. This changed a lot. It's changed a real lot. I mean, this this cut right here used to be wide enough for just this boat to go through. And look at it now, how wide it is. This is how far the land used to come up right here. Right. That's, that's how far the land There was land on both sides. I could have dived on the one side of the bayou, touch this side, and get up on this side and don't, don't come back without getting up. I mean, I'm only 54 years old, so I mean, to me it sounds like a long time, but then if I sit here and start thinking about it, when I was a teenager, how, how narrow these cuts were. I mean, even this bayou here, it's amazing how much oak trees we had on this bayou. You know, beautiful oak trees, and with all the salt water intrusion, it just killed them all. No, we, uh, we don't have the barrier islands to protect us from the tidal surge like we used to have. It gives you a sense that this is a slow-moving um, a slow moving disaster, a slow-moving crisis. The changes here are fast by any kind of scientific or geological time scale, but they're slow by the time scale that a lot of people live by, and, and quite frankly, that, that the media goes by, where there's not, unless there's a major oil spill or there's a hurricane, there's not a lot of changes from one day to the next. We're opened up here, we're vulnerable here. I mean, we ain't got much land left to stop anything anymore. If we was to get hit by a storm like hit Florida, don't come back here. There's, there's not gonna be nothing left. The 2017 master plan uh, is the most recent update to our integrated master plan for sustainable coastal Louisiana. It includes about 124 projects that we think are, are the, uh, the best investment for the state of Louisiana um, to help sustain our coast. Those projects range from wetland creation projects, marsh creation projects where we dredge sediment, build marshes, ridges, barrier islands, oyster reef projects, hydrologic restoration projects, and then uh, things like levees, flood walls, flood gates, um, things that we, we term structural uh, risk reduction projects. It's a, a plan that's going to cost $92 billion. Uh, based on uh, average inflation uh, going back to 2007 when it was announced at 50 billion. So far, the nation has given about $10 million to this $92 billion plan. Uh, the state came into a windfall, a horrible way to come into a windfall with the Deepwater Horizon disaster. So it's been getting half a billion dollars a year for 15 years beginning, I think, two years ago. So it has enough money to keep going for about eight or 10 years. It has eight or 10 years to find a permanent funding source for this plan. Because if it doesn't, then it has to start taking projects off the boards. And that means they can do less and will have less of a coast. Our solutions are we need to put sediment back on Louisiana's coast. We want to use the river to put that sediment back. And that's what these sediment diversion projects aim to do. Simplest explanation is you put floodgates in river levees at key spots, and when the river's high, like it is right now, carrying tons of sediments, you open those floodgates, let the river go back out into those sinking basins, and over time, rebuild land. These systems can build land at a rate of about an inch a year, which is 
pretty fast and um, and faster than the rate at which we're we're sinking and water levels are rising in, in many cases. And you can build land that's stable and that's resilient to hurricanes. They're controversial for some commercial fishers because, you know, the commercial fishermen have been making their living off of this delta as it's falling apart, becoming saltier, basically. Many of those areas that are salt water today are very productive for a lot of things we like to eat. And there's a concern that if you were to bring a lot of fresh water in the area, you could change the habitat in a way that would make it less suitable for things like shrimp and oysters. Coastal species are usually really resilient. Um, but it's hard to say if they are pushed into a fresher environment at a critical life stage what that will do. So it's something that we're trying to describe so that we can either prepare for that or you know give people peace of mind. You know, they, they're doing a lot of lip service to, 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 to get our input, but they don't listen to our input. For six years, I've been you know screaming and, and telling them what it's going to do to our, our seafood industry and our economy. And, and uh, oh, we'll take that in consideration, but they're still barreling their head on, on you know, the projects. And when the, the master plan was first announced, and there were meetings everywhere. But it's, it, no one's going to get involved until it's staring them in the face, right? So now there's first a diversion's about to hit. And so now they're very worried because, yeah, it's very likely that their things will be will moved around. Not only will it instantly destroy the oyster fishery, the shrimp fishery will be right behind that, and then the fin fish fishery, and then the crab fishery. I figure within the first year, most of these guys won't be able to make a living. Then your hardware stores, any grocery store here, you'll have the domino effect, the fallout from it. This solution is going to apply to Miami. It's going to apply to Manhattan. We've got to set the right precedent. This is an important laboratory for millions and millions of people around this country. Whatever helps our coast, I'm okay with, but I don't want to destroy the industry that we work so hard to work on, because that's we live off of the seafood industry. We live off fishing, and, and if that affects that, then you know, it, it affects the lives of a lot of people that live in this area. So we really have a choice in Louisiana. Are we going to allow that change to occur and essentially inflict its, its will on us and where we work, where we live, where we play, uh, or do we try to uh, take the initiative to manage that change, hopefully for the, for the most good, for the most people in coastal Louisiana? I have to fight for this. I have to fight for them. Because I grew up here, they want to grow up here, and I want to see my grandchildren come and visit me, you know, years from now in this area. But if it's flooded out, what can we do? Hey NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.